Dr. Nicholas Carderis is one of the country's foremost addiction and mental health experts. He is a psychologist. He's written two books on how screens are hurting our children's development. And today he's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about the science behind the damaging effects of screen time and social media addiction, how the algorithms are pushing our kids towards unhealthy thinking patterns, unhealthy lifestyles, inhibiting them from real healthy social interaction, inhibiting actual debate and discussion in this country. Wow, this was a fascinating, fascinating conversation. A lot of encouragement and tools for you parents too, who are trying to develop your kids in a healthy way away from screens. And so you're absolutely going to learn a lot and love this conversation. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Dr. Carderas, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, Can you first tell us who you are and what you do? So I'm a psychologist who specializes in a variety of uh, expertise in addiction, mental health. My my wheelhouse has been over the last 10 years in digital media and how that's impacted people's mental health. I run treatment programs around the country that I've developed. I've been a professor at Stony Brook Medicine for 10 years. a clinician that has been, I think, one of the first, I was one of the first psychologists that began to sort of raise up the red flag that, or the red flag, uh, a flag of awareness or that there's trouble in, in yeah. the waters of digital media in our society. You wrote a book last year, it came out, Digital Madness, How Social Media is Driving Our Mental Health Crisis. I think a lot of people would probably just agree with that title that social media isn't great for our brains, especially the adolescent brain, but most people don't really have the words to describe how. So when you've studied this, like what is it exactly about social media and screen time that is kind of deteriorating not just everyone's mental health, but specifically the mental health of teens, young people? Right. So I wrote a book before that called Glow Kids in 2016. Yeah. And, and the, the first realization is this is sort of a multi-phase process. Oh, there you go. There's Glow Kids. <laughs> in Glow Kids, it was, I, it was one of the pioneering books that looked at, can technology be habituating? Can we get addicted yeah. to our devices? And, and, and one of the narratives has been, um, as we've grown mad for our devices, our, our, our devices driving us mad. Um, The research, and I included over 200 peer-reviewed studies that looked at how, yes, we can be addicted to devices. Uh, They spike our dopamine in ways that are very habituating and classic addiction neurophysiology. Um, But but addiction was just the price of admission. Uh, What we started seeing then is, yeah, we were not only becoming addicted to our devices, and especially younger people were getting uh, disproportionately impacted by that addiction. So what did that addiction translate into? And that's when we started seeing the mind shaping effect. So the neurophysiology of a young person gets compromised developmentally uh, the more they're on screens. We've, we have clear fMRI research that shows that. Basically, the prefrontal cortex, the executive functioning part of our mm-hmm. brain, that part behind of our, our forehead, um, it begins to shrink uh, in the same way that it does with chronic substance addiction. So it compromises things like our impulsivity, our decision making. Um, and it creates a highly impulsive um, profile over lifetime. So we've created addicted people who are can't can't manage without their devices. But then now we are seeing that predictive algorithms that are very predatory attack vulnerability uh, because the name of the game is engagement. So if the predictive algorithm smells or senses that the user is um, has body image issues or is politically predisposed a certain way or has other underlying uh, vulnerabilities, it sends content that really exacerbates those vulnerabilities. And this was this was shown by Frances Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower that came out about a year and a half mm-hmm. ago, and she pulled the curtain back on Meta's own research with Instagram that showed that the predictive algorithms of Instagram were attacking uh, essentially vulnerable adolescent females that were to a level that it was increasing their suicidality. So suicide rates for, for British girls were going up 12% and for American teenage girls, they were going up 6%. 
So it was making people more depressed, more suicidal. But then we started seeing psychiatric influencers who were really popular on sites like TikTok, who were getting billions of views, the TikTok Tourette's phenomenon, dissociative identity disorder, the gender dysphoria issue, all these um, psychiatric issues were spreading via digital social contagion. And, and so we've always had social contagions. And basically, the definition of a social contagion is behavior that spreads via social means. Mm -hmm. And so something like smoking is a social contagion. If your friends smoke, you're likely to start smoking. But now we started seeing the impact of influencers who were having millions of followers that were now shaping via social contagion means their, their devotees. And we started seeing huge spikes in personality disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, suicide, all the toxic psych metrics were spiking. Yes. And there's so much in your answer that I want to unpack and ask questions about. Going back to what you said about the addiction to social media or the use of screens of young people hindering the development of the prefrontal cortex. And that is mm -hmm. that's the part of the brain, right, that's not developed fully until about age 25. Is that correct? Correct. So you Correct. mentioned impulsivity because um, the prefrontal cortex is what allows us to kind of foresee the consequences of our actions, to make better decisions, right? To have a little bit more discernment. Yeah, called, Go ahead. Right. Consequential thinking. It's called if-then thinking. So it allows us to right. consequentially think. It allows us. It's 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 basically where our critical thinking and our decision right. making lives. It's a, it's a big part of, of who we are developmentally as human beings. Right. And so any parent especially can, un even if they don't have the language for that, they understand that their toddler doesn't have impulse control or even their teenager who just started driving. There's a reason why insurance is high for these young people. It's not just a lack of experience. It's also a lack of ability to be able to see how their driving consequences or driving actions could have certain consequences. So you're saying that screen usage is inhibiting the development of a part of a brain that um, that is already, it's like already kind of com competing. It's already mm. trying to, um, it's already trying to like take its proper place in a person's decision making. And this is making it even more difficult for young people to be able to mature in that way and then to make proper decisions. Is that what you're arguing? Yeah, it stunts the development of the prefrontal cortex. And if you want to get a little bit more technical on it, there's really two ways that the brain imaging research shows that it does that. As our prefrontal cortex develops into, you very accurately said, our mid-20s, there's something called the DGM, which is the dense gray matter. And the dense gray matter is essentially the robustness of that part of the brain. What we've seen in MRIs of chronic substance addicts and chronic screen addicts is the DGM tends to shrink. So essentially, you're shrinking that part of your brain that you need to be full and rich and robust. That's one aspect of the neurophysiological effect. The other aspect that has to do with what's called the myelination or the myelin sheath of the brain. And that's sort of the insulation cable of our neurons. Uh, strong, a strong myelin sheath allows our brains to be um, to communicate well, to, to function well. So things like dementia and Alzheimer's are myelin sheath abnormalities. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is that the myelin sheath with chronic substance addicts and chronic screen addicts begins to show, um, it's called microstructural abnormalities. So it shrinks the gray matter of the prefrontal cortex and it attacks the myelin sheath in ways that really stunt development. There's not, and that was, I think, the most shocking part. You know, I'm a parent as well. So, yeah. you know, I'm a psychologist. I've taught, I've taught neuropsychology, but I'm also a parent. So I've got skin in the game as, as, <laughs> as, a, as one of those. Yeah. And um, I think that's what shocked most people. Most people thought, all right, screen time, little Johnny and Susie are getting kind of too habituated to their little phones. But they weren't really, you know, once people started seeing in black and white the brain imaging research, that was the sort of Houston, we have a problem moment for a lot of folks that started realizing this is more significant than I think most people, most of the adults in the room anticipated. Because most, I think the problem was most of the adults, most of us of a certain age, conflated modern tech with television. Yeah. And most of us grew up on TV. So we thought, all right, these are just smaller TV sets, but they're not because right. of the, the, two fundamental differences are they're much more interactive yeah 
right? So they're immersive and interactive in the ways that television never was. So that's, thus they have a much more impactful effect on our brain. All right, let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Adele Natural Cosmetics. Adele Natural Cosmetics is a family-run, holistic, handcrafted, toxin-free cosmetic company. All of their products are made by them in the U.S. I use their stuff every day. I use their cleaning, their facial cleaning regimen. I love their everyday cleanser. I love their serums. It just helps my skin feel really healthy and uh, really smooth too. I've seen a really big difference in the texture of my skin since I started using Adele Natural Cosmetics. And I love that all of their ingredients really are holistic and natural. This is another one of those companies too that they believe the things that you and I believe in. They are staunchly and publicly pro Life. That's what I love about them. They've got great makeup too. I love their foundation. It matches my skin perfectly. Visit AdeleNaturalCosmetics.com. Enter code Allie for 25% off your first order. AdeleNaturalCosmetics.com. Code Allie. Do you find that TV screen time has the same effect on a young child's mind as phone screen time, considering like the kind of animation and the kind of content that kids are now getting from television. It's a, it is a lot more immersive. It's a lot more interactive. It's a lot more entertaining. It's a lot more addicting. Um, so do you find that the gray matter in the brain responds the same way when there is a child who is addicted to TV versus a child who is constantly given yeah. an iPad? So the person who did all this ADHD and screen time research was Dr. Dimitri Christakis at the University of Washington. He's also the editor of the uh, JAMA Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics. So he's a pretty uh, well-respected researcher. And he started doing research on television effects on ADHD back in the 90s. And he's since done it with interactive screens like iPads and Chromebooks. And back in the 90s, if you're So the key developmental windows for children with their attention is between the ages of two and six. That's when their brain is really developing their ability to attend, to focus Um, in the same way that like language is a developmental window, right? We've seen that if kids aren't exposed to language during the key developmental window, they're going to become lifelong compromised with language. We've seen that with like feral kids who've never been exposed to language. They can never really get language because that part of their brain devoted to language never really got nurtured at that key time. So it's the same thing with attention. So two to six is that key window for attention. And Dr. Christakis's research showed that for every hour of television, this is back in the 90s, you had a 10% higher rate of ADHD. So if a three-year-old watched three hours of TV uh, back in the 90s, they had a 30% higher rate of ADHD when they got older. They did that same research with interactive, modern tablets and screens, and that effect was exponentially increased. Mm -hmm. So the ADHD rates were spiking more significantly, which, by the way, explains our spiking rates of ADHD. There's a reason why our kids are now uh, being diagnosed to such a great degree. And, you know, one of the counter arguments had been, well, we're just more sensitized to ADHD. So we're just happen to be diagnosing it more. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as a researcher and as a clinician who works with young people, we're not just diagnosing it more, it's happening more. You know, it, yeah. anybody I think with eyes can look around and see our kids are much more um, attentionally challenged. They're yeah. bouncing out of their skins more. If they're not constantly being entertained, they can't focus. Yeah. Um, and, and look, at put two and two together. I think anybody with reason can see yeah. we've overstimulated kids to the point where they become stimulation dependent. Yes. Well, I think that that's true even in adults. And if that's true in adults, someone who right. didn't grow up really with social media. I mean, I had some like crude forms of it. I was born in the early 90s. And so we did have AIM at some point. And then later we had texting, but really think, and I thank the Lord for this, like we didn't have Snapchat and Instagram and all of these algorithms trying to constantly vie for our attention. I wasn't addicted to my phone every night before, you know, I went to bed. I actually read books. It might've been trashy teen fiction, but at least it was reading. But I've even noticed, you know, in my own life, obviously the dawn of real social media, the kind that we have today was when I was about in college. And so for the past, 
10 or so years, I have had social media and I've noticed in myself, I have a lower attention span. I can only read for so long. I can only do one thing for so long. If I'm watching TV, I find myself also wanting to open up my computer or scroll right. on Instagram. So That's if that right. is true for me, someone who really wasn't introduced to this kind of social media until my prefrontal cortex was at least almost fully right. developed, of course, that's going to have a huge effect on these kids who have yet to be developed, right? Well, that, that's such a great point that you're making because, by the way, guilty as charged also, and I'm a few months older than you are, a couple <laughs> decades older than you are, so, and it happens to me too, right? So I've noticed that my own attention wanders much more readily. Uh, Nicholas Carr, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize-nominated Nicholas Carr, who wrote The Shallows, he writes in the opening part of his book about he can't go more than two pages without his mind wandering, and he's in his 40s. So if it's happening so significantly to us with our fully developed brains, imagine what's happening to these developmentally vulnerable children yes. and adolescents who, who are much more impacted by exactly what you just said. Yeah. And, and do you find, like if you were to look at the brain of a 16-year-old, and I don't know if this part matters, but maybe one that didn't grow up with constant screens, but maybe they were introduced to social media when they were 15, 16 year, years old. You look at their how their brain reacts to that stimuli versus how like a four-year-old's brain reacts to the iPad. Is it similar or is the development that that 16-year-old has, does that does that help them at all? Yeah. Does that make sense? Or is it very similar yeah. just in all adolescents, how their brain responds to screens? No, the, the four-year-old is going to be more susceptible than the 16-year-old. That's why, you know, one of the biggest mantras that I keep repeating to folks is delay, delay, delay as parents, you know, as much mm. as you can delay the exposure to the device because your kid is going to get a little bit more immunized uh, the older they get. Now, the other part of that is not just neurophysiologically, right? Not just will the prefrontal cortex be developing, right? Because it just doesn't go from four-year-old to 25-year-old. It, it's kind of developing its armor uh, and, and it's neurosynaptically growing. But uh, a person's sense of identity and who they are is a little bit more fully developed. So there's less, you know, what I like to call brain shaping, right? Because a lot of the work and people that I've worked with have been, uh, I've worked, you know, I was an expert witness for a capital murder trial for a teenage kid in Florida who had mm -hmm. been radicalized by ISIS and, and decapitated a 13 year old wow. because of this brainwashing effect. He was a YouTuber who couldn't stop watching YouTube and eventually went down these political rabbit holes where he went from being progressive liberal to white supremacist to six months later, ISIS started sending him recruitment videos and decapitation wow. videos. And this wow. quote unquote, nice kid turned into this uh, ISIS warrior. And, and he didn't have a core sense of identity. He didn't know who he was. So all these shaping influences were much more impactful. Yeah. He had, he was basically a healthy kid, but he got brainwashed at 16. You're more likely to get brainwashed at, eight, 10, 12, but the older you get, the more we like to think that our sense of identity has developed more. So we can, uh, you know, I use a phrase that I think is apt here. It's, it's our psychological immune system. We have a more developed psychological immune system right. the older we get. So we're less vulnerable, hopefully. But that doesn't mean that the 25 year old is not going to quit their day job and join a biker gang. You know, we can all get susceptible to cults and to weird things no yeah. matter what age we are, but less so. Yeah. You know, something interesting that I found is actually like my parents' generation, it seems, and I've talked to a lot of, I'm, I'm a millennial, a lot of millennial friends who have also found this. We won't hold that against you. Go ahead. Yes. They are less, um, my parents seem to be like less believing that screens are super damaging to kids. Like, I feel like I'm more cognizant of it. Like, I'm more worried about my kids even holding my phone or, you know, accidentally scrolling or being on an iPad, whereas kind of the baby boomer generation, it seems they don't see the consequences of that quite as much, which I don't know, you might think it's the opposite because they grew up without technology. They understand the benefits of that. But I actually find that a lot of friends my age, like yeah. we're having to convince our parents, like, you know, please don't let them on screens and things like that. Not that my parents are constantly, you know, putting my kids in front of screens, but they just don't seem to see the consequences as much as we do. Have you found that? Yeah, that's, that's a great point that you make. Because even though we'll, yeah, 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 you know, the 
the whole boomer. I'm, I'm cusp Gen X boomer. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, my, my kids are, you know, six, I have twin boys who are 16, so I get the boomer comments a lot. Yeah. But, um, but you're absolutely right because of what I think what I said earlier was, again, the older generation conflates modern screens with television. Yeah. And so, you know, the boomer thinks this is, you know, I watched I Love Lucy or, you know, I was watching Starsky and Hutch as a, you know, as a right. <laughs> 20 year, year old. So we tend to think that this might be just television. And so that's why we don't fully appreciate it, where the millennials get it more because you get it because, you know, the one fact that's interesting is when you look at mental health metrics by generational cohort, like things like depression, um, the baby boomers have the lower rates of depression and the most face-to-face -face friends. Then you go down to Gen X and millennial and then yeah. Gen Z. And the younger the cohort, the more connected the cohort, the more psychiatrically unwell they are. So one in five millennials have zero friends. Uh, wow. you know, it's a pretty high number to have zero yes. friends. Yes. And, and, and that wasn't what we were told because I remember the before times, like kind of yeah. like you, I remember the before social media times. And the promise of social media, Ali, as you'll remember, it was going to be connectivity. It was yes. going to be this amazing new tool for a social species. So it was going to be like social media for a social species. It was going to be like chocolate and peanut butter. It was going to be this yeah. great mix. And theoretically, we were supposed to be healthier because we'd have more friends, more connections. And that's a good thing for human beings. But what we found is that this was a, a counterfeit connection that digital connection isn't the same as a face-to-face -face friendship. Yeah. And in fact, it robs us of face-to-face -face friendships because we're so uh, uh, sedentary, isolated, screen staring that we're not really developing these meaningful face-to-face -face friendships, which really are what nurture our psychological immune system, yes. our soul, dare I say that word. Yes. And so your generation kind of sees that more because you're living it. You're seeing your depressed friends and your friends who can't leave the house and your friends who are, you know, getting in substance, taking more because they're depressed more where maybe the boomers are kind of like a little bit under aware of the realities of some yeah. of the younger people. Okay, let me tell y'all about Naturally It's Clean, that cleaning company that I post about on Instagram sometimes that you guys are always asking, wait, what's that cleaning company? It's Naturally It's Clean. This is the stuff that we use to clean our home. I like it because it's got the plant-based enzymes. I mean, we're talking like hospital grade stuff, super effective, but it doesn't have any of those nasty chemicals or any of those fragrances or anything like that that really kind of make your home pretty toxic and bad for your pets and, and your family. That's why I like naturally it's clean because it really works especially like the carpet stain remover incredible the clothing stain remover works really well i use the multi-surface cleaner the most just because it's so versatile i can use it in my kitchen or bathroom um and all of that good stuff i really love naturally it's clean also very patriotic people people who care about the things that you and i do bob vila says the naturally it's clean has the most eco-friendly carpet stain remover on the market today which is awesome and as i said it's also very effective. My audience can get an additional 15% off for a limited time by visiting naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie for an additional 15% off. Where I've seen it among kind of my age cohort for, and I'm thankful that I'm married, but uh, my friends who are on dating apps right now, they have the kinds of interactions with guys that I just that I mean, even 10 years ago or 10 or however many years ago it was that I was that I was dating. Yes, it was digital and that you would text or you would maybe talk on the phone or something like that. But now it seems like with the rise of dating apps, there is even a higher acceptance of what's typically referred to as ghosting or basically interacting with someone on an app, even saying that you're going to go on a date and then just standing that person up or not responding. And it does seem like our reliance on social media, on dating apps for connection has rather than helped us connect with people, it's actually right. inhibited our ability to connect with people on a real level. And it seems like it's made people a lot more insecure, a lot more scared to actually interact with people in person because they no longer have, I don't know, the skill to be able to do so. It does take a right. certain level of courage. Well, our interpersonal social skills have atrophied because we haven't used them, right? So, like you said, this, the courage that it takes to walk up to, you know, got 
to ask somebody out in the date, you know, that was a, a skill, right? It was a right. muscle that you had to develop. And if now everyone is essentially hiding behind the screen, you don't develop those skill sets. Um, it's interesting. It gets even worse when you talk about sort of dating and relationships with adolescents now when you start talking about things like porn and, ex- yeah. you know, kids right. that, you know, there there are 12 and 13 year olds that have seen hardcore porn yeah. that, you know, uh, earlier generations, you know, back in the Playboy magazine days where um, you had isolated imagery and and you weren't um, desensitized to certain imagery. So yeah. or certain not imagery, but even sexual kind of exposure. And so uh, there's a new phenomenon over the last 10 years called adolescent erectile dysfunction. Mm. Um where this is a thing that pediatricians talk about. I was at a conference where this was, you know, the topic. Um, we'd never seen that before. You didn't have a thing like adolescent ED because uh, now what we're seeing is teenagers have been so visually overly exposed to imagery that, you know, good luck going on the date now with the prom queen or with anybody right. because now you have these idealized or like overly um well, you know, yeah. uh, you, you've seen things that that don't really relate translate into the real world or don't translate into you having a healthy functional and and we have things like now misogynistic imagery and and violence. sort of uh, violence and all, all right. those things and there, the, the there desensitization tr- to all that oh, go ahead. yeah there, well there was a trend of of young girls like you know i don't know 13 14 years old on tiktok i i don't remember it was called some hashtag or some viral thing that they were all talking about in these separate videos about how they like to be choked or that their first right, sexual interaction right. was a violent sexual interaction well, look that doesn't just come out of nowhere i mean that's they're being right. presented with that they're being told that that's what it takes to be attractive that's what it takes to be sexy right. or that's just what sex is you have to be okay with that in order to be acceptable or attractive attractive to a guy or whatever. And you're right. These kids, they're being introduced in some cases to pornography at at nine years old. And of course, that's going to affect your sexuality. That's going to affect your self image. It's also going to affect how you relate to other people if you primarily view them as objects rather than people with, as you said, souls. Um, There's so many consequences to social media that I think we don't see. And, and what you said also is such a good point, just how pornography used to be different. Like you used to have to like you saw on the side of the highway and maybe the middle of nowhere, those very <laughs> smutty, dark, like right. XXX, you know, buildings. Right. And you would pass by them and be like, oh, I wonder who would ever step foot in somewhere like that. That's so embarrassing. Like there was a proper stigma around that kind of thing. You had to go out of your way to hunt for the kind of sick stuff right. that now is readily available on TikTok. There's no stigma. It's all in secret. And a kid can, you know, go down the rabbit hole that you described alone in his bedroom and his parents might not even know and adults too, adult relationships i've worked with a lot of couples who you know and now because of the easy access and ubiquity of like you said um there's plenty of husbands out there who are porn addicted and it's destroying their marriages and it's it's just part of that that thing um you know i think the larger cloud of social media the one thing that i talk about in my most recent book is i really you know, because now we start talking about AI and predictive algorithms and this very intentional attack on our, um, again, psychological vulnerabilities. I've really grown to, I've grown to understand social media as almost a sentient living organism um, driven by uh, predictive AI controlled algorithms that feed off of our most lizard brain emotional mm, extremism. And so, it, it'll because emotional reactivity feeds engagement, right? If you tickle that part of my my being that that gets an emotional response, that's going to increase engagement. So the social media is acting like a heat seeking missile that that attacks emotional reactivity, whether it's political, whether it's psychiatric, whether it's whatever the content is that can get a rise out of us. Then we feed the beast attacks us. Then we feed the social media organism, it, our lizard brain feeds it, then it feeds us back in what's called an extremification loop. And so round and round it goes and it creates this polarity chasm where like if I'm left leaning or if I'm right leaning, it's going to amplify those uh, propensities because it's going to feed me more and more increasing content in either direction because again, reaction, emotional reaction is the name of the game. You're not going to get nuanced, well thought out, reasoned content because that doesn't that doesn't raise the thermostat of my emotional reaction. And so 
social media thrives off of this hyper emotionality. And so what we're seeing, because I'm treating 17 to 30 year olds in these treatment programs around my one program in Austin, Texas, in particular, we, um, we treat tech addiction type of issues and social media issues. You're seeing young people who are much more highly emotionally reactive, who can only see things in black and white, who have a really hard mm. time seeing nuance and, and, and discerning things. And so they're, they're essentially like hardwired, emotionally reactive yeah. nuclear bombs. They're, they have meltdowns and they're, they're collapsing and they need the safe spaces and all these stereotypical wow. things we've read about. Yes. So the, there's this fragility that we've now baked into young people. And I'm convinced yes. it's a social media driven fragility. Yes. You know, that is so fascinating because of course I've seen that and I've never attributed that to kind of what social media causes that black and white thinking. I mean, I'm sure there are a variety of factors. I think a lot of kids are learning to think this way also in their college classroom, but it probably is already baked in at that point because of what social media promotes. But I've noticed that in my interactions, not with all students on college campuses or all the you know young people that maybe like message me things, but if you do try to discuss with them like a very maybe complex topic, like any of the culture war issues, whether it's abortion or whether yep. it's gender and try to just move them right. past the talking points, like move them past the maxims that really don't make any sense, move them past kind of right. the circular reasoning that they're regurgitating. The response is anger and frustration yeah. and name calling yeah. rather than saying, right. oh, okay, well, this is how I think about it. It's almost like they are completely incapable in some cases of formulating an original thought, That's right. a nuanced thought and actually taking what you say and then responding to it in a way that is thoughtful. I find that it's almost impossible for a lot of young people to do that right. at all. And I never thought about that, it being attributed exactly to social it. media. Well, that's, well, that's exactly it. So, so, so this hyper fragility, like you said, talk about any, any hot topic issue, intersectionality, whatever that yeah. may be. And Jonathan Haidt, I think talks about this well as yes. well. And he wrote his book, the coddling of the American mind. He's yes. an NYU professor and he's created the heterodox Academy. So back in the before times, again, I'm an old timer. And, you know, back when I was at university, you can talk to people who have dissenting opinions and have really, you know, informed, interesting conversations. And nobody collapsed on the floor, sucking their thumb or was in yeah. tears or was raging at you. Right. You would say, OK, what about this point? What about that point? And then you go and get lunch together. Um, so now you're having this, this, and again, it looks very much, this a, a particular personality disorder called borderline personality disorder. And then digital madness, I think what I wrote was that I think we have a societal diagnosis of BPD, uh, mm. where, because the symptoms of BPD are black and white thinking, um, very emotional reactivity, um, not clear sense of identity. And, and it looks like the societal diagnosis is that. And, and if you look at some of the complex things that I mentioned social media does. And so Jonathan Haidt talked about that he began to see the safe space trigger warning fragility at about 2010, uh, around the advent of iPhone, social media, uh, you know, our, our deeper immersion into technology. And that's when we started pathologizing language and started saying language was dangerous and we needed to protect ourselves from this harm. And that's when university administrators started saying, language is no longer free speech language is now harmful and 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 i think we did such a disservice to university students and i was a professor for 10 years and i saw it each year uh each and i taught at a graduate school uh, i mean these were graduate students that you couldn't i mean they would have breakdowns if uh you yeah. know uh you said a wrong word right and 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 it was new this wasn't something that we had seen so people like jonathan Hyde and, and myself were were I'm, I'm attributing it to this new landscape that we've created that has really just created this fragility. And then when they get out of college, they can't live life on life's terms. They wind up in places like my treatment program because now they're depressed, isolated, wanting to commit suicide uh, in front of a screen for 14 hours a day, escaping, you know, numbing themselves through a variety of digital escapism and or self-medicating through other substances as well. Because if you're a highly impulsive uh, because of the way, <clears throat> excuse me, if you grew up on this, you're going to be um, not well in a variety of ways and just not able to function in the world. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing Gen Z is having a really hard time functioning. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, another pause to tell you about a really, really important sponsor. One of my most important sponsors, just because of the work that they do, and that is Preborn. Preborn uh, helps women keep their babies by providing free sonograms and free services for them that informs them about pregnancy, informs them about their real life giving options. And they have saved hundreds of thousands of babies just by showing women the truth of the life that is growing inside of them. Preborn Network of Clinics has rescued over 200,000 babies. That's incredible. Those are little image bearers of God that preborn has helped save through these free sonograms. And so you can be a part of this. You can be a part of their mission. You can donate to this cause. You can help save these lives by just dialing pound 250 and then say baby, pound 250, say baby. Or you can go to preborn.com slash Allie, preborn.com slash Allie. You'll get more information about how you can donate. Blaze has a goal of 70,000 babies saved in 2023. So help us be a part of that by going to preborn.com slash Allie. It seems like that too. And a lot of parents, you know, I've, I've, I've read a lot of testimonies from parents who will say, you know, my child was, um, you know, a, a normal girl, a normal guy. And then they went through these hard adolescent years, which we all did, by the way, but they started spending more time on their phone. And maybe this parent was a little naive and said, I didn't really know what they were doing on their phone, but I thought, you know, it's fine. Or maybe even there were a parent who said, I thought I was checking their social media apps. And then one day over time, this person, this young person, teenager seems to have developed different kinds of mental issues, seems very depressed, very anxious. This is something that we see a lot with a rapid onset, so-called gender dysphoria, especially among girls. And these parents are saying, what the heck? Like you were just a normal girl, liked girl things. And all of a sudden you're wanting these hormone treatments and things like that. I I mean, there is a whole world, I think, that young people can get sucked into just depending on where the algorithm takes them that can completely kind of transform who they are as a person. I think we as parents like to think that that's not possible, that we've laid a good enough foundation. But I think we underestimate just how formative those teenage years are and how susceptible these young people are to a completely new change in identity that is brought to them by social media. Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, when, you know, it used to be like the, the cafeteria in high school used to be, you could see the different cliques and different identities, right? There were the jocks yeah. and, yeah. and the, you know, the, all, all the different groups. And, and so every teenager is going through this sort of a search for identity. Who am I? And it's been the rite of passage historically forever. But the, the way that social media has now changed that, and you're exactly right with things like gender dysphoria. I mean, we've been gaslighted as, as a society um, gender dysphoria is a real thing. I'm a clinician. I've worked with genuine gender dysphoria, right. but it's so ex- the real article is so extremely rare right. in, within the society. And we've seen a four thousand percent spike in late onset gender dysphoria, female to male. That's not explainable by uh, any. There's no uh, traditional explanation for that other than the social contagion effect. And so you have vulnerable teens looking for identity who now fall down whatever rabbit hole that it may be. So you may now, and let's face it, we're also looking for community in the sense of belonging. And so, you know, we, I I remember we had a client at our clinic who she was depressed because all her friends went off to college and she didn't. And so she was going through what we would call moderate depression, not even severe clinical depression, but she was feeling alone and empty and, and a little bit rudderless. And she just fell down a BPD rabbit hole, a borderline personality disorder rabbit hole. And she started identifying with this group. And a lot of BPD uh, women tend to be very histrionic and over the top. And so their videos online, their social media tends to be really popular because it's performative. And it's entertaining, as is something like dissociative identity disorder, uh, which we used to call multiple personality disorder. So now there's influencers online who have DID who have 100 alters. Now, again, I've worked with the real deal, dissociative identity disorder. You know, the what we used to see in the movies, Sybil and Three Faces of Eve, real dissociative identity disorder, uh, sexual trauma in childhood, you create a sort of an alter identity to compartmentalize the trauma because you can't really 
live day to day without trauma, but it was very rare. And typically you had a handful of alter identities. Uh, now you have these influencers who have a hundred identities across the LGBTQI spectrum. And, and they're really popular because they're very performative and people tune in, young people tune in to watch what's called switching. So when, uh, when, and they, they call themselves a system. So system Susie yeah. is now going to go from 28 year old white female to 45 year old black male. And that switching is very entertaining because it's like this dramatic, yeah. um, performance. So a lot of this is performance art. A lot of it is, um, attracting people. And now they start sort of emulating this, these psychiatric symptoms with the late onset gender dysphoria, which I, I'm calling now in many cases, pseudo gender dysphoria right. and the proof in the clinical pudding, which I want to, I think it's important that I hammer this point home. I treat these issues. And in my clinic in Austin, we've had people that have come in with gender dysphoria diagnoses and borderline personality disorder diagnoses. And in my treatment program, it's two months residential and there's no technology, there's no phone, social media. Um, when they're away from those influences, uh, a, a healthy number of those people by the end of, because we do a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy and we do a lot of dialectical behavioral therapy, which is the type of therapy you're supposed to do if you have borderline personality disorder. By the end of two months, they're no longer, the, the gender dysphoria has gone away. Uh, for many of them, not all of them, but for many of them, you see that it's gone away. You see the borderline personality disorder is not there anymore. That shouldn't be because borderline personality disorder, if you have the real thing, it doesn't get cured in two months. Gender dysphoria doesn't get cured in two months. Right. And so if something goes away after you're off of social media for a few weeks, that means that you didn't really have the disorder to begin with. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that a lot of these kids are just sort of consciously or unconsciously mimicking these uh, behaviors or these disorders because they're now aspirational. Right. Uh, you're, it's cool to be trans now. Um, there's a whole host of right. social pressures to to go down that path. Yeah. And like you said, it's a loss of identity. And if and it's a loss of community too. These people think yeah. that they're finding real communities through the, you know, BPD community or the trans community or whatever right. it is. And so you're getting affirmation. There's also a I, I think I speak as a non psychologist, but I think there's a part of the brain that also I mean that likes affirmation. It seems like something is released when you get affirmed, when you're told wow, you're incredible. You're so brave for posting this. Look at you being a part of the destigmatization of, you know, gender for whatever it is. And so it's not even just like the mimicking that I think goes on. It's also the affirmation of a new identity, a sense of belonging and purpose that these people become addicted to and attached to, which is why I think it's right. so hard for them to release it. And it becomes so real in their mind. That's it. That's be beautifully said. You know, I think we're all looking for a team to belong to, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to not be picked for a team. And and that goes back to evolutionarily, uh, we needed, you know, the sociologists use a term, the tribe survived. It's baked into our, our psychological DNA to need community and connection because we had strength in numbers evolutionarily. We We were not the strongest or the fastest species. And to survive in prehistoric times, we needed a community. And so there was strength in that community. And so that's been baked into who we are. So now when you're looking for community and you're isolated in front of a screen, you don't have genuine community and you have potential pathways or rabbit holes that you can fall into. It's exactly what you said. It's kids and young people who are looking for a team to join. Um, you know, and 25 years ago, these were young people that might've been joining a cult or, or finding a, a, a genuine, more meaningful community, whether it was faith-based or, you know, uh, a sports team, um, you know, where I live locally, the, they couldn't feel the foot, the high school couldn't feel the football team last year because there weren't enough kids, young uh, teenage boys willing to put in the effort mm. because gaming is easier. Uh, yes. It takes effort to oh. try out for a football team and go to practice every day. It takes effort to date. Like you mentioned before, yes. it's, 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 it's changed things so dramatically yes. in ways that are not, not very good. Yeah. You know, I, there's a lot that I want to respond to what you said. We only have a couple more minutes, but I, I spoke at a university the other day in California and there were a group of protesters 
outside who, and I didn't engage with them, but there were people, you know, that could have come to the event that we did an entire Q and A. And we had a couple people from the other side of my position who came in and asked me questions, although it was very much a, okay, you're not even hearing or responding to anything that I'm actually saying. You're just saying things that I've heard a million times on social media. But the crowd outside who was yelling at me, calling me a coward for not coming up to them outside and, and, you know, I don't know, hearing their chants or something. I'm thinking, you know, why didn't they come to the event? The event was open. We could have had an interaction, but I'm thinking it takes more effort. It takes a lot more effort, a lot more energy, a lot more courage to actually face someone that you disagree with, have a conversation with them. Of course, it's easier to stand outside and say your stupid chance. Like there's no effort. There's all the virtue points in the world that comes with something like that. But it just takes too much effort to have the difficult conversations that we need to have as a functional society. Um, Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, because I don't think that we have even seen fully these chickens come home to roost. I mean, like only now are we starting to see what it looks like when a young child has been on an iPhone basically since toddlerhood and is now growing into an adult. I mean, we've kind of touched on these things, but if you were to like quickly summarize, like what's the consequence of this? What is the what's the societal consequence or even the individual consequence of our kids having their main form of reality being on their phones? Yeah, reality blurred kids who can't function or like you said, you know, talk about those college kids in California. Think about that. They don't even have the ability to have a rational discourse with you, right? They have to be their lizard brain worst, right? They have to just spew venom um, because that's all they're able to do. I think that's all they've been primed to do at this point. So the reality is that we're, you know, we're going to be a society gone mad. You know, look at I look at the Navy promotional video where you have a drag queen that's that's right that's the upside down part of the society i never thought that we'd be at a place where you know up would be down uh you there'd be no such thing as a woman you know you you speak so powerfully about these issues you know we need warriors in this cause and we need the adults in the room to speak up and to say speak truth um and and the, the rest be damned i'm at a point in my career you know where i don't really care what um, you know, I'm secure in what I do and, and, yeah. I, and I feel it's my moral and ethical obligation to speak truth and to say the emperor has yeah. no clothes. Yes, I'm not going to use pronouns or say, because once you give into the little, yes. you know, everybody in the university that I was at has to do the, the pronoun signatures and I'm not willing to do that because it's yeah. absurd. And, right. and so I, I am seeing grassroots pushback. There are young people. I'm sure you've seen them on campus. There are young people who are. Yeah. There's a grassroots movement of an awakening of of saying this is absurd, uh, and hopefully that that grows because if the other side keeps uh, this trajectory going, we're going to sort of implode as a society. This is sort yeah. of the end times of Rome. Okay, last sponsor for the day. It's an important one. Um, and that is Epic Will. So if you don't have a last will and testament, especially if you are a parent, but really if you're just anyone, you need to make sure that you have that. That is a way to be responsible. It's a way to be an adult. It's a way to make sure that your family is taken care of, taken care of should something happen to you. Hopefully you won't need it for a very long time, but it's good to have it in place. And I understand lawyers are expensive. You don't want to go through all of the time, all of the stress that it takes to get a last will and testament, but that's why Epic Will exists. They make it so easy. All you have to do is go to epicwill.com slash Allie, and in less than five minutes, you can get a last will and testament. And plus, if you are a single mom, you've got kids under the age of 18 at home, you get this absolutely for free. Isn't that an incredible deal? So go to epicwill.com slash Allie. You'll save 10% on your complete will package, which is only $119. So you're saving so much time, so much money, so much stress. By going to epicwill.com slash Allie, you'll get that discount. Epicwill.com slash Allie. What is your encouragement advice to two groups of parents? We got a lot of moms that listen to this podcast. Most of them are probably in my in my age. I've got just little kids, um, but then you've got some that are teenagers or their kids are teenagers, and that group is thinking, "Well, I can't, I, I can't stop." my kids from being on social media at this point. You've got two sons, you said, who are 16 years old. 
And then there are also like the moms of kids my age that you're like, oh my gosh, but like the screen helps me cook dinner or whatever it is. So what's your like encouragement and advice, hard truth to parents when it comes to how they treat screen time, social media, all of that with their kids? What should we be doing? Yeah, I mean, for the younger, for the younger moms, for the younger kids, it's delay, delay, delay. The older your your child, before they get a portable device, the better, right? For the reasons we said earlier, because it'll give them a better chance to develop their own sense of identity and their prefrontal cortex development. For the ones who have teenagers already, it's not too late to to really give countervailing forces, mm-hmm. sports, music, g- clubs, community, things. To, Get your kid engaged as much as possible um, because the, the more countervailing forces you have in the young person's life, the less the gravitational pull of the screen is. The kid who doesn't have a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, that's the kid that's going to get more lost in some of these things. So it's basically being a proactive parent, not a helicopter parent, because I think the helicopter, I've worked with a lot of tech addicts who whose parents were overly, um, had mm. their 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 boot on their necks and the kids were escaping sort of um, hovering parents. Yeah. So, you know, it's a kind of a fine line to be a proactive parent without being a helicopter or a bulldozer parent. Um, you know, one of the most successful parents is a, is a good friend of mine who's a professor also. He's had these wonderful kids grow up. And I said, what was your secret? And he said, well, benign neglect. Um, <laughs> because I think sometimes we as the parents are uncomfortable with our kids finding their own path, right? So there's a fine line with let me give you some support without doing everything for you because the more I bubble wrap you, the more I'm going to make you not, I'm not going to build your psychological immune system, but I do need to make sure I'm trying to point you in the right direction. Uh, But I can't walk for you. I can't fill out your college application for you. Um, So, but these are challenging times, right? We're all trying to sort of figure out our way forward, but that would be my best advice um, to really... uh, be careful yeah. and to, for the little ones especially. For the little ones especially, don't delay, have any devices delay, till they're delay. at least 12 or 13. Yes. And you know, I've, I mean, not to keep going, but I've just noticed that with my kids that when you give them the opportunity, even if they're like, no, I want to watch, you know, whatever it is, cartoons, which my kids don't have any like devices or anything, but even just TV, like if you just kind of get through that maybe tantrum or that frustration that they have and redirect their attention, they're still at the age where they will learn. They do learn how to dedicate their attention to something else besides the screen. They can do it. Like their minds, I think, are still elastic enough to be kind of retaught. Um, And so I like also, go ahead. If if I can add one thing to that, you know, all the research shows reading, right? If you can make your kid a lover of reading, yes, this research that shows, you know, reading competency at age seven and love of reading at age 15 are the best predictors of lifelong success. Yes, I believe Um, that. If you can, and, but but then there's uh, competing research that shows kids who are on screens are three times less likely to like reading because let's face it, reading is, it, it makes reading boring, right? If you're playing hyper immersive video game, this and digital world, that good luck reading war and peace. So carving out time to read with your child, if they're young and, and giving, giving them wonderful books when they're in middle school, instill that love of reading. Yeah. You could do some TV and some other digital stuff when they get middle schoolish and past. But if you can bake in the love of reading, that's the one sword that will best immunize your your young one for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And parents of teens, it's it's not too late, right? Like if they want to, if they've got a 15, 16 year old at home, they haven't been monitoring their social media or screen time or anything, even though it's more difficult, it's not too late for those parents to start reassessing how they're parenting in that arena, right? Absolutely not. It just might be a little bit of a higher climb, but yeah. absolutely not. And it's worth the fight. It's worth yeah. the fight. Yeah. And more details on this. You've written books about them. So I just really encourage you guys. I'm guessing they're wherever books are sold. Last year's book, Digital yes. Madness, and then Glow Kids written in 2016. So all the science and different tips and things like that you've already written about. And um, I just really appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time you, to come you. on. And thank you for what you do, by the way. I really appreciate your efforts with all this as well. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I told you guys, you were going to love that conversation. You know, I don't always get 
to say everything that I want to say because I want to make sure that my guest is able to articulate their position fully. But one thing I was thinking that I just wanted to follow up on, he mentioned how in prehistoric times, um, the advantage of the human species was that we formed community and that is how we survived. Of course, I would say as a Christian that God made us that way. He made us as communal beings. He made us to need fellowship. That's why when God made Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he made Eve as his helper and saw, and saw that this was very good. Um, and also we see that because we are made in God's image, as we read in Genesis 127, that means there is a part of our need for fellowship that is reflective of God himself. And that is reflective in the nature of God, that he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is eternally, constantly in communion with himself. And because we are made in his image, we are not meant to be in isolation. Like you even read in Jesus's life that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, into isolation, so Satan could tempt him. Of course, he used the power of God and uh, his own divinity, his own godness, and the power of the word of God to fend off Satan's temptations, but he was pushed into isolation for that temptation. And so all of these things, I think, indicate to us that real in-person interaction and not the isolation and the fake connectivity that we see on social media is actually embedded into the human psyche by a loving creator who knows what's best for us. As with all things, science is constantly just trying to catch up to God. Um, all right, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back soon.